So um, tonight, um, I'm going to talk to you, and it is an academic lecture, as Professor Fletcher has said. It is not a, a chat or a walk in the park, so to speak. It is an academic lecture, and I've left uh, a reading list outside. Now, this is not for homework, okay? This is in case you'd like to follow up on some of the reading. And I'm particularly delighted tonight to have quite a large number of my students here. And this is particularly useful because they're going to answer all the difficult questions at the end. <laughs> so thank you, students. Wonderful to see you. Okay, so um, my lecture, um, and I'm also um, teaching an undergraduate unit at BU um, with the same uh, title, actually, and the students that are here tonight uh, are from that unit. So they're not bored yet, which is a good sign. So um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes. Um, that might be longer than you expected, but I'm afraid that's it. There's 50 minutes of it. And Sarah at the back is going to give me a signal if I run over. And I'm going to draw on uh, sociologists' work, historians, anthropologists, psychotherapists, and psychoanalysts. And they're all in there somewhere. And I'll try and take you on a journey uh, as we work through um, these different aspects. Obviously, this is not something I learn. This is, this is something that um, I'm going to need to refer to my notes. But uh, I'll keep trying to remember that you're there. OK. So, um, um, so um, the history of love and intimacy shows a fascinating interweaving of social, economic, and cultural influences and explanations. And the focus of much of the debate around love and intimacy is on the historical emergence of romantic love and intimacy in the West. And as David Shumway, who is professor of English at Carnegie Mellon University and also author of Modern Love, Romance, Intimacy, and the Marriage Crisis shows, he says that romantic love in this sense is best understood as a culturally specific discourse which is most clearly defined in the history of Western culture. In fact, the traditional meaning of love does not relate directly to passion or intimacy, although we'll be coming to that. As David Shumway says, the traditional meaning of love is not romance but actually social solidarity and corresponds to the capacity for bonding rather than the capacity for infatuation. For most of Western history, as German sociologist Nicholas Luhrmann argues, what was considered important is not living out one's passions, but rather a voluntarily developed solidarity within a given order. That is, basically, you fit into a particular type of emotional regime within different historical periods. Romance as a historical and cultural discourse, as probably some of you know, has political and economic dimensions. In medieval society, romance emerged actually as an alternative to conventional marriage, which was officially sanctioned by the aristocracy. It offered a cultural alternative and a shift in manners and morals in the court of feudal Europe. A number of writers also comment that this was marked by the idealization of love. As Shumway maintains that part of this was the role that women played um, in idealizing love. Previously, hard to believe, women had been seen as a corrupting influence, but they came to be idealized within the discourse of romance, and at the same time, love was also idealized. In fact, as we'll see, women have played a significant role strategically in the evolution um, of love and intimacy, um, and we'll pick up on that as we move along. The emergence of romance as a counter discourse, that is, in opposition to marriage, established the separation of love and marriage. The French historian Georges Duby, and I've listed some of his books on the reading list that I've left for you, comments that whether love and marriage were compatible 
was the great question that agitated the courts of Champagne and Ile de France. The relationship between love and marriage was captured in Capellinus's 12th century treatise on courtly love, De Amore, where he states, everybody knows that love can have no place between husband and wife. The history of love and intimacy has been documented in a number of significant books, including Denis de Rougemont's Love in the Western World, Nicholas Lerman's Lover's Passion, The Codification of Intimacy, and Anthony Giddens' The Transformation of Intimacy, among others, of course. These bring together both historical and sociological perspectives and indicate the historical shift in the development of love and intimacy. And I'm going to look at some of those historical shifts before we get to the contemporary um, relationship scene. Both historians and sociologists show that class, gender, and sexuality are all important points in the intersection of the historical development of love and intimacy. David Shumway shows that historians have long connected the rise of companionate marriage, keep that in mind, and the later association of romantic love and marriage in the rise of the bourgeoisie of the middle classes. The aristocrats, of course, needed marriage of marriages of alliance to preserve their power and wealth. And the working class typically married for the economic advantage that extra hands brought to the household. It is rather the new middle classes, the petty bourgeoisie and the professional managerial class who were positioned economically and educationally to develop these new patterns of love and intimacy. And the expansion of the professional managerial class throughout most of the 20th century is one of the conditions that enable the discourse of intimacy to develop. Now, while I haven't done research on this specifically, interestingly, uh, Sir Merton and Lady um, um, Annie uh, Russell Coates could be seen as part of this growth of the new middle class. They owned the Royal Bath Hotel, and their money came from the, the Royal Bath Hotel, as far as we know. Um, and um, one of the interesting things about their life is the role love played in their lives um, and in their collections of works of, this wonderful collection of works of art reflecting both love and eroticism. And when you do a tour, you will, you will see uh, much of that, I'm sure. Historians are themselves divided about the relationship between love, intimacy, and marriage. The English historian Lawrence Stone argues that in the 16th and 17th centuries, marriage was arranged by parents for the economic and political benefit of the wider family and not the emotional satisfaction of the individual. In the 17th century, he argues a new type of marriage emerged in England, which he calls the companionate marriage. This was not based on romance, but as Stone comments, was based mainly on the temperamental compatibility with the aim of lasting companionship. So we'll see how relevant that is to contemporary relationships shortly. However, while Britain was languishing in the companionate marriage, the French were developing a much more passionate environment for relationships. The German sociologist Nicholas Luhrmann shows that the French aristocracy developed a social code for what was, in effect, adulterous love, which he calls somewhat appropriately, and excuse my French pronunciation, amour passion. He maintains that manuals printed during the time gave instructions on seduction. Shumway indicates there was a reaction to this, as expressed in different cultural forms from the late 18th century, on, uh, including Mozart's opera Don Giovanni and Laclos's novel Les Liaisons Dangereux. Some of you may remember the film Dangerous Liaisons with Glenn Close and John Malkovich. The film is based on Christopher Hampton's play Les Liaisons Dangereux, 
which in turn was a theatrical adaptation of the 18th century French novel by Laclos. This present, presents the seducer as an evil person and an exploiter of, of women. We'll see how the tables are changed, are turned later on. It was the extension of individualization alongside the rise of capitalism which allowed the bourgeoisie to influence the direction that love and intimacy took in Britain. However, as Shumway shows, the 19th century provided a wide range of responses to the relationship between love, intimacy, and marriage, and he claims that the relationship was most clearly defined in America than elsewhere. The US sociologist Francesca Kansian, in her book, Love in America, Gender and Self-Development, comments that in the early 19th century, marital intimacy in the modern sense of emotional expression and verbal disclosure of personal experience was probably rare. Instead, husband and wife were likely to share a more formal and wordless kind of love based on duty, working together, mutual help, and sex. I know you were waiting for that. So um, let's look a bit more closely at some of these perspectives or these, these ideas, these models about love. Romantic love is often defined by contemporary theorists as a product of we Western cultural history. However, Octavio Paz, in his analysis of love and the erotic, in his book, The Double Flame, Essays on Love and Eroticism, shows that it can be found in all societies and in different historical periods. However, while the performance of a culture of love emerged within court societies in the West, and as Mike Featherstone, a British sociologist, notes, became an expression of love as a privileged body of knowledge and practice by a small group of men and women, it was not restricted to the West. Paz shows that this form of courtly love emerged not only in Europe, but in the Islamic world, in India and East Asia too. The Chinese novel Dream of the Red Chamber by Chao Shui Jin and the Japanese novel The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Chibuku both describe love affairs in the courtly aristocratic world. Paz also maintains that there are further distinctions between West and East as far as love and intimacy is concerned, in terms of how love developed. The distinction was based on the fact that in the East, love was framed within religious traditions, whereas in the West, it developed as part of a larger critical philosophy. Thus, as we can see, the history of love is therefore a social and cultural movement both reflecting changing philosophies and driving them. There's a vast literature on the romantic love in the 12th century. De Rougemont's Love in the Western World talks about the French Provençal poets as being an influential and potentially subversive group in the emergence of romantic love in 12th century French poetry. The evolution of this literary genre shows shifts in the class-based history of romantic love. And as Mike Featherstone shows, important here was the transition from chivalrous poetry written by noblemen for aristocratic women of their own strata to romantic lyric poetry written by and performed by non-aristocratic professional poets who wandered from castle to castle. The poetry was not constructed to be read, but to be heard, with poems accompanied by music and performed in the castle of the great lord. Now, there are class and gender aspects to this emergence of this lyric poetry. The poets were inferior in social rank to the ladies they performed for, just as it should be, of course. The subject matter of the poems was heterosexual love. And given the class background of the poets, they were spoken in the vernacular form and not in Latin. Now, this was also to allow the ladies of the court to understand the lyrics. It is also claimed that the emergence of romantic love was accompanied by the rise in status of women and that by comparison with the pattern of arranged marriages, love relationships were daring. <laughs> 
and that's been really the pattern of things, as we'll see. In order to fully understand how romantic love operated, the US sociologist Professor Anne Swidler from the University of California, Berkeley, maintains it's useful to look at its origins and evolution in European cultural history. The significance of courtly love poetry which emerged in Europe at the end of the 11th century was an important intervention in establishing a new conceptualization of the self and a new vision of love. As indicated earlier, the lyric poetry was sung by troubadours in the courts of feudal France and central in the love poetry was the role of noble women and the lyrics told of knights who are made virtuous by love and of heroic deeds performed in the service of noble ladies. While much of Western history has told of the dangers of love, in courtly poetry, love was seen as ennobling rather than a dangerous appetite. Love in courtly poetry, espoused by a knight, encouraged the performance of heroic deeds and led to the transformation of the self. Within the courtly tradition, love was a spontaneous passion, love at first sight for an ideal lover. Uh, not only did it encourage virtue, but it also led to individuals defying social convention in pursuit of a higher destiny. Anne Swidler shows the courtly love remained the dominant code of the European mobility for centuries, but the courtly ideal of love was gradually reshaped by the bourgeois culture of early capitalism and was expressed in its quintessential form in the 18th century novel. Notice how again you get a different kind of literary genre which was influencing the direction of love, as I'll show you. Swidler comments as follows, love in the novel remains a drama about virtue, but rather than simply inspiring heroic deeds, love becomes a test of individual character. In bourgeois love stories, individuals still discover and defend their integrity, but rather than betrayal and death, the bourgeois love story ends with a marriage in which the autonomous individual finds his or her proper place in the social world. So there is a moral there as well. Now, we've touched on this idea of passionate love and romantic love. So what's the difference between the two? The distinction between romantic love and passionate love is an important one in the history of love and intimacy. The British sociologist Anthony Giddens, who some of you may have heard of, in his book, The Transformation of Intimacy, Sexuality, Love, and Eroticism in Modern Societies. Hard to believe that he was also political advisor to Tony Blair, and, and also director of the London School of Economics, and currently sits in the House of Lords. So, good to see a sociologist with many dimensions. He makes the point that the secular use of the word passion as distinct from religious passion is a modern concept. In romantic love attachments, the elements of sublime love tend to predominate over that of sexual ardor. Romantic love, um, which began to make its presence felt from the late 18th century, drew upon these ideals and incorporated elements of amour passion. When we think of passionate love, it implies a connection between love and sexual attachment. However, Giddens points out that romantic love is often thought of as implying instantaneous attraction, love at first sight. And insofar as immediate attraction is part of romantic love, it has to be separated, he says, quite sharply from sexual and erotic compulsions of passionate love. Giddens maintains the passionate love has never been seen as a basis for marriage, and in most cases is seen as disruptive. He distinguishes between passionate love as a universal phenomenon and romantic love as culturally specific, as we've seen. As I've said, sociologists and historians have all recognized the link between marriage class 
and, and class, and that marriages were contracted on the basis of economic circumstances far more fully than sexual attraction. The US feminist sociologist Stephanie Kuntz in her book, How Love Conquered Marriage, argues that romantic love and erotic attraction rarely into, enter into traditional um, marital matchmaking. Giddens also makes the point that the peasantry in 17th century France and Germany, kissing, caressing, and other forms of physical attraction were rare among married couples. However, it was common for men to have affairs. The aristocracy also allowed respectable women to have sexual liaisons. The reasons for this was that women were liberated from reproduction more or less, and routine work which allowed them time to pursue sexual pleasure. And that issue of sexual pleasure we'll return to very shortly. For men, there was a tension between romantic love and passionate love, which resulted in a separation of feelings, which, as Giddin says, with, as Giddin says, the comfort of the domestic environment separated from the sexuality of the mistress or whore. The US sociologist Judith Stacy, in her recent book, Unhitched, argues that few married women living in traditional cultures then or now would define love much differently. Throughout most of human history and still throughout most of the world, romantic love has occupied a realm outside of marriage, reserved chiefly for men and members of the aristocracy who would dare to engage in liaisons that were decidedly dangereux. She says that most family systems try to manage the conflict between desire and domesticity by sacrificing the yearnings of the former to the demands of the latter, especially when the former belong to women. Stacy argues that, quote, a hoary host of patriarchal marriage systems rigorously restrict and at times excise women's sexual and romantic cravings in order to secure the fruits of their procreative and domestic labors. Okay, no throwing things at this point. So let's move on and look at um, the role of popular and literary fiction in terms of the growth of uh, love and intimacy. One of the key drivers of romantic love was the growth of popular and literary fiction, which was a result of the growth of the print media, of course. Romantic love coincided with the rise of the novel in the late 18th century. Women um, became increasingly influential in the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly with the rise of the romantic novel, which was often written by them, including uh, Fanny Burney, Charlotte Lennox, and Radcliffe, and of course, Jane Austen, leading very ordinary lives like all of us, but turning out some outstanding um, and interesting pieces of work. The impact of romantic fiction was powerful and at the same time devastating. Lauren Stone claims that the romantic novel of the late 18th and early 19th century has much to answer for in the way of disastrous love affairs, and of impudent and unhappy marriages, says Stone. Regardless of the dangers of romantic love, Mary Evans, centennial professor at the Gender Institute, the London School of Economics, argues that there's a strong case for supposing that romantic love was a formative part of the gradual ideological emancipation of women. Um, and the public definition of a specifically feminine set of interests. Crucial in this was the exercise of choice in the selection of partners. This was a movement still entrenched in class politics and patterns of inheritance. But for those not constrained by inheritance, there was a much greater freedom to select partners. So Evans maintains that women through the discourse of romantic love could exercise choice in whom they would marry and construct male behavior in ways likely to produce love in women. This significant shift in emphasis of men in love was subsequently reflected in 18th century English novel, novelists, 
by English novelists and portrayed the man in love as not driven by power, money, gambling, and, not div and divorced from inexpressive masculinity, but as driven primarily by the desire to show he was in love. Heroes as diverse as Fitzwilliam Darcy in Austin's Pride and Prejudice, Tom Jones in the novel of the same name, Count Vronsky in Anna Karenina, Karenina, all became apparently destabilized by their love for women. However, the glamour of these passionate romantic heroes was thrown into relief by the growth of a critical school, which offered a significant critique of romantic love. As Mary Evans notes, Cosi Fantuti was, was completed in 1790 and combined with the novels of Jane Austen, offered a scathing attack on romantic love and at the same time ad endorsed a form of sexual equality. Cosi Fantuti is an Italian language opera that Mozart first performed in 1790. It was written by Lorenzo da Ponte, who also wrote The Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni. And in fact, Cosi Fantuti means, thus do all women, and sometimes it's, it's defined as, and popu popularly used to mean, women are like that. Thus, um, courtship was, of course, still about a selection process, emerged in class, and emerged in economics. And the selection process still involves status and ranking and assessment through the social environment. Beauty also played a part, but was not a significant driver of romantic love. As the feminist sociologist Eva Illouz states, it is these mechanisms at once social and moral, private and public, that regulated the middle and upper middle class choice of mate well into the 19th century, at least in the English speaking world. <coughs> what changed in modernity, um, and I'll come to that, are precisely the conditions within which love choices are made. But before I come to that, I'd like to detour slightly to look at bohemian love, partly because it's so well expressed in the collection at Russell Coates in a pre-Raphaelite collection in particular. Bohemian love had a radical response to love, well, certainly to marriage. And whereas the growth of the romantic literary tradition had offered a contestational, that is, it contested notions about linking love and marriage, some highly critical of romantic love, none had challenged marriage to the point of rejecting it entirely. However, as Elizabeth Wilson, who is author on, and writer on feminism and popular culture shows, bohemian love did just that. And of course, the pre-Raphaelites were central in that movement. One of its central components was the rejection of bourgeois marriage and conventional form, family forms and the espousal of eroticism as a source of inspiration for works of art and there are many examples of this in the Russell Coates collection. Um, the Bohemian tradition took different forms in different countries. Uh, Wilson also says that the 19th century Bohemian men uh, refused the conformity of bourgeois marriage and expressed their rejection in very open relationships with prostitutes. The Bohemian tradition also showed the emergence of the transgressive femme fatale. And this was expressed in a variety of different forms, from the figure of Carmen in Bizet's opera, to the real life Bohemian author, George Sand, whose life matched her published work in its unconventionalism and its gender politics. While I don't have time in the lecture to deal with the life and loves of uh, Georges Sand, fascinating life, um, I devote a section of my book uh, to her and um, her work. Erotic attraction in the 20th century became increasingly to be defined in terms of sexual desirability and the shift to physical attractiveness and beauty and away from the moral world of values. 
While erotic attraction had always implicitly acknowledged sexuality and beauty, the feminist sociologist Eva Elouz maintains that its deployment as a, as a pervasive cultural category is modern. Elouz highlights the contrast between the 19th and 20th century conceptualizations of love, sexuality, and beauty. The shift in emphasis to beauty and physicality in the 20th century is seen by Elouz as part of the cultural commodification of beauty and sexuality. So, in the 20th century, the late 20th century and early 21st century, sociologists call these periods a periods of late modernity. So if I refer to late modernity, you know what I'm talking about. And what we've seen in this period is a growth in the more individualized nature of intimacy. Sociologists uh, identify this shift of intimacy in late modernity as what they call detraditionalized compared to earlier periods. And Anthony Giddens has been in the forefront of developing this notion of detraditionalization of relationships. We've already kind of witnessed the fact that ch there were changes in definitions of intimacy. There were new images of love and eroticism coming from philosophers, artists, writers, and others from the middle of the 19th century onwards. And this had liberated intimacy from traditional frameworks, making romantic love a more significant element of relationships. So what do we mean by detraditionalization? as defined in a sociological sense. We mean the abandonment of traditional partners of intimate relationships, including lifelong heterosexual marriage, as the primary framework for the establishment of relationships and the procreation and raising of children. We mean the abandonment of male dominance within heterosexual households. This is not wishful thinking. This is what Anthony Giddens says, so we must be right. Um, we mean the abandonment of marriage and the ascendancy of cohabitation. Sexual intimacy has been redefined in late modernity with relationships following different trends, including serial monogamy, cohabitation, non-marital childbearing, same-sex relationships, and marriage. In addition, divorce rates have risen dramatically to 50% and over in many countries, well, almost. 43% in Canada, 46% in the US and Australia, 55% in Sweden, 43% in the UK. Now, single parenthood, remarriage, and blended families are much more the norm. In his book, The Transformation of Intimacy, Anthony Giddens sees tradition as being swept away and individuals having the opportunity for the growth of what he calls reflexivity, that is a much more clearly defined definition of individuality and individualization. Anthony Giddens maintains there's now greater equality within heterosexual relationships, and he outlines what he describes as a transformation on the basis of relationships and intimacy to what he describes as a pure relationship, where sexuality and intimacy are tied together. My students will all know this very well. The type of int intimacy involved in the pure relationship, according to Giddens, is based on equality between individuals. And the pure relationship is characterized by democratic principles and matched um, by a pattern of sexuality, which Giddens calls plastic sexuality which is a form of sexuality free from conventional definitions. Plastic sexuality is where sex and procreation are separated and where sex is enjoyed for its own sake. Giddens maintains that a revolution in female sexual autonomy is, of course, an aspect of this, with women finding sexual pleasure in ways which are not dictated by men. And in addition, the growth of same-sex relationships is another area. However, feminist writers such as Judith Stacy have maintained that Giddens um, is hopelessly optimistic about the change in the nature of relationships. Giddens is not the only one 
who's talked about changes in the nation in the relation to intimacy in late capitalism. Eva Elouz develops the linkages between romance and consumption. And within this, she analyzes the role of the love affair. Elouz is an insightful observer of the changing nature of relationships. And she recognizes that the lifelong romantic narrative has largely collapsed and that the affair is now the more compressed romantic narrative form. Elouz um, acknowledges that the arise of the affair is directly related to the transformation of the role of sex in relationships since the Second World War. The principle on which the affair is based is choice and market framework within which to choose. As Elouz shows, the experience of waiting, which was the pattern of Victorian women's lives, is now eliminated. And Elou says this is replaced by periods of sporadic, romantic intensity. She notes that affairs then are self-contained narrative episodes disconnected from one another in the flow of experience, resulting in a fragmenting of experience of love into separate emotional units. Elouz makes it clear that sex has always been a feature of relationships outside marriage, but she claims that the character of these contemporary affairs is distinctively what she calls postmodern for the following reasons. Firstly, she says, they, they institutionalize liminality. What she means by this is that affairs are located away from home and work, removed from marriage, family, and domestic responsibilities. So they operate in a kind of um, um, a vacuum, so to speak. Secondly, Elouz claims that the character of sexual pleasure is more about liberation than previous embodiments of sexual pleasure, captured in the dominance of such pleasures by males such as Don Juan and Casanova. As she observes, com contemporary affairs are more likely to be lived as sexual pleasure by both sexes. Thirdly, Elouz argues that affairs are not about a deliberate statement of transgression, and they don't set out to challenge normative or moral imperatives. That is, they're not necessarily setting out to change the world. In other words, affairs don't set out to undermine conventional standards, but are about the uh, pursuit of shared pleasure. The affair is, of course, linked to adultery. And whereas traditional adultery was seen as being initiated by men, increasingly women are seen to initiate adulterous affairs. The nature of modern romance and relationships has changed significantly in recent decades. Aziz Ansari's book, Modern Romance, gives a light-hearted perspective on love and romance in the United States. The book is written in conjunction with Eric Kleinenberg, professor of sociology at New York University. And Zari makes a whole lot of points, and I'm only going to touch on some of them. First of all, he says that traditionally, people would marry one another if they were in the same town or the same neighborhood, block, or building. But he now talks about the new transnational character of relationships with people living in different countries and maintaining relationships and Skype-based relationships as well. He also talks about the fact that people are getting married uh, later and that in the US, uh, the, uh, the age of marriage has risen to 29 to 30 and for, for women, 27 to 28. In Britain, it's a bit later. Um, with 30.8 for women and 33.4 um, uh, for men. Stephanie Kuntz says that the shape of marriage began to change profoundly in the 60s and 70s, led by women's equality. Women extended their education, gained good, job, ga gained good jobs, achieved economic independence, and gained control over their bodies through the pill. In recent decades, in most developed nations, marriage rates have dropped precipitously. Philip Cohen, a leading demographer of the family and a sociologist, has documented the steep and widespread decline in global marriage since the 1970s. His figures show that 89% of the global population live in a country with falling marriage rate. 
In the United States, marriage rates are at historic lows. There's also been a significant rise in cohabitation, with figures for cohabiting couples doubling in Britain since 2004, according to the Office of National Statistics. The delay in marriage, of course, could be related to the delay in terms of when people get married. So what kind of relationships are people having today? Okay, well, I'm not asking you a question. I'm <laughs> just hold on there. Okay, I don't want to know. Uh, on the issue of what the most typical form of love is within relationships, if you recall, we previously talked about pa a compassionate and companionate love. So what's the distinction between passionate and companionate love? It's argued that companionate love is neurologically different from passionate love. Passionate love always spikes early, then fades away, while companionate love is less intense but grows over time. The anthropologist Helen Fisher, author of the book The Anatomy of Love, was part of a research team that gathered and took brain scans of the then middle-aged couples who had been, who had been married on average of an average of 21 years, while they looked at a photograph of their spouse and compared them with brain scans of younger people looking at their new partners. What they discovered is that among the older lovers, brain regions associated with anxiety were no longer active. Instead, there was activity in the areas associated with calmness. Well, you know, it's a trade-off, isn't it? Loss of excitement, calmer life. The transition from passionate love to companionate love can be tricky. In his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, New York University social psychologist Jonathan Haidt identifies two danger points in every romantic relationship. One is the apex of the passionate love phrase, phase, which then turns toxic, ending in divorce. And the second is the time when passionate love starts wearing off, and the conclusion is that person may no longer be the right one. So how do people meet and fall in love today? Well, Aziz Ansari looks at online dating and how it's changing the nature of relationships. Online dating had its origins in the 1960s with the emergence of the first computer dating service. Um, and, of, uh, and also, classified ads have always been popular in terms of both marriage and um, partnerships. Ads took off in the 1960s when weekly newspapers were full of ads for what are called thin markets, LGBT, older straight people, and middle-aged divorcees. We've seen an explosion of online dating agencies. Match.com was launched in 1995, and by 2005, Match.com claimed it had registered 40 million people. Other sites opened up, including eHarmony, Tinder, and OkCupid, and most offered a quasi-scientific method of filtering through the use of algorithms. Eli Finkel, an American psychologist, published a paper in 2012 in Psychological Science and said that no algorithm can predict in advance whether two people will make a, a good couple. He says that there is no compelling evidence supporting matching sites' claims that mathematical algorithms work. Much online dating, Finkel says, is based on the faulty notion that the kind of information we see in a profile is actually useful in determining whether a person would make a good partner. But because the information that is provided on the profile is limited, um, we overvalue what we see. Finkel says that this causes us to make bad choices about who we go out with. And Don Slater's history of online dating, called Love in the Time of Algorithms, found that there was a huge discrepancy between what people say they wanted and what they matched up with. I mean, it's like buying a dress online, isn't it? You know, you get distracted. So Ansari also talks about the role of privacy cheating and the internet site Ashley Madison, which some of you might have heard of, which is designed to help people have affairs and has an estimated, although not verified, 11 million members in 2014. 
The site was, of course, famously hacked in August 2015, leading to a certain amount of relationship disharmony. The case of adultery provides some interesting insights into love and intimacy. Called the crime of uh, secrecy, David Turner, in his book, which is a historical book called Fashioning Adultery, Gender, Sex, and Civility in England, 1660 to 1740, shows how um, um, adultery um, became what was called a criminal conversation and how both men and women um, um, suffered uh, as a result of uh, criminal cases brought against them as a result of adultery. For men, the charge conveyed a failure of responsibility, an abuse of authority if the affair was with a servant. For women, adultery generated revulsion among society who saw the actions as constituting domestic rebellion. The crime of secrecy continues in today's what are called spouse-busting websites, which, I love this, which list a host of apparently incriminating activities performed by partners. E-spouse software's top signs of a cheating spouse, listen carefully, include a sudden interest in a different type of music, a sudden preoccupation with his or her appearance, an excessive amount of time on the computer when you are asleep, well, how would you know, <laughs> and deleting emails. Finally, and drawing on the work of my colleague sitting in the audience, Professor Candida Yates, and others on the issue of emotional management and jealousy and social change, we can see how emotional management of feeling changes in the 20th century and in the climate of neoliberalism of the 21st century. Yates draws critically on the work of Frank Furidi, who discusses the backdrop of emotional management against a therapy culture through self-help books and cognitive behavior therapy programs, where even normal everyday jealousy is often considered irrational, pathological, and in need of a cure. Yates raises the issue of whether the wider context of emotions throws up the notion of a masculinity in crisis. She's sinking lower and lower in the seat. And the broader notion of the unraveling of traditional conceptions of masculinity as a social and cultural construction. Yates draws on the concept of jealousy to show how it is a useful concept to test the capacity to cope with complex emotions that arise in relation to wounded narcissism and anxieties about separation, rejection, and loss. So we can see that the issue of jealousy, and more seriously, often male violence towards women, as resonating with a masculinity in crisis. Well, as you can tell, I could continue all night, but time to close, but I'm closing with finesse. Thus, when we discuss love and intimacy in contemporary society, it is impossible to understand the complete picture without understanding the history of love and intimacy, and in fact, the idea of the sociology of emotions and social change. What is important in understanding this complex interweaving of theories and feelings, it's part of an evolving picture which requires a social and cultural understanding of emotions and how it impacts on our emotional well-being. In the end, in understanding love and intimacy in contemporary society, we really do have to ask the question, what has love got to do with it? I'd like to close by drawing on the words of Mary Evans, and who else could one call on? The history of the narratives of romantic love are diverse, contested, painful, and seductive. That's me, not her. There is no single ideology of romantic love, but a nuanced and varied range of discourses. And as Mary Evans says, and this is one of my favorite quotes, quotes so please indulge me. The social tragedy of romance and like its many personal tragedies, is that just as it seemed possible to recognize the loneliness of the human condition, and Frankenstein's monster in Mary Shelley's novel spoke for everyone when he cried out for human companionship, 
and to attempt to build an ethic of love which would diminish that loneliness, social and material factors usurped romance and love and forced them into the endlessly infantilizing constructions that we know as 19th and 20th century love and romance. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay. <laughs>